and the slides are there. Great. So yeah, this talk will basically, uh, yeah, I just want to tell what we did uh, during the last year and what the plans for the future are with regards to solidity. Um, I want to start with explaining what what the the initial goals were for solidity. Um, so the the idea was to to have a statically typed language that is easily readable for web developers or for not necessarily web developers, but for I don't know casual programmers. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we, we, we chose something that looks like a symbiosis between JavaScript, C, Java. Um, and it should be high level, but at the same time, uh, it should be also very, very efficient because there's not a lot we can do inside a single block, at least currently. And uh, yeah, keep that in, keep that in mind uh, because sometimes uh, yeah, solidity looks really really high level, but actually it's not that far away from assembly. Okay, what happened since DefCon one? Um, we extended solidity to be more flexible, uh, more usable. So we added some some usability features, and uh, not to forget, we made it. Safer, at least I hope so. <laughs> so, what exactly did we do? Next slide, please. Um, it's now possible to build custom types in Solidity, um, and that leverages the new features of inline assembly uh, and uh, libraries that were present for DEF CON 1 already, but we added uh, so called internal library functions. And not to forget the using X for Y. So let's look at an example. Uh, this is, uh, I think, Nick Johnson's string library, at least a, a small fragment of it. And uh, it, inside this library, you have this struct slice, which defines a new type. And it's basically a, a view on memory. It, it has a pointer, which is, so it's, it's a kind of, rather low-level object. It has a pointer and a length, so it references uh, a chunk of memory. And the function to slice can be called on any string, and it uh, creates such a slice object that references the data of that string. Um, that is important because usually when you, uh, when you um, create, so, <laughs> We want to be able to reference parts of strings, and if we use just the string type itself, we would have to copy it all the time. And using this slice, we can talk about parts of strings. And let's, so at the bottom, we have a contract that actually uses this uh, slice. Um, it takes a string, it calls to slice, which converts it to such a slice, and then checks whether it starts with foo. So it, it uh, yeah, checks whether the prefix is foo. And uh, no, not yet. <laughs> so, and the great thing is that you can, so using this using strings for star statement, you can basically attach functions from a library to an existing type. And that's why we can call s dot to slice, although s is a, a built in uh, type that usually, that, that of course does not have the function to slice. And uh, I think this is a really uh, powerful tool. Uh, especially when coupled with inline assembly, because you can uh, create tools using inline assembly without having to change the compilers. You can uh, basically add types that look like built-in types, but you do not have to take uh, you do not have to look into the compiler. Okay, what we also did is uh, we so we um, extended the AST output capabilities. And uh, one of the goals there is to provide more, make the compiler more accessible to external tools which want to do static analysis or debugging. And um, so this is still a bit fluid, so we might change the, we might still change the, the design of the AST output. But um, 
as an example, we have the, the statement return x plus y, and this uh, gets converted into the, to the following JSON, a representation of the AST. AST. We have an ID uh, which is used to reference other nodes in the AST. Oh, perhaps I should, so AST stand, is short for abstract syntax tree, and that is basically a representation of, a, a structured representation of the source code of a program. Um, and so this return x plus y is decomposed in the re return statement, and then inside this return statement we have a binary operation, which is the addition, and uh, the two operands again are inside the binary operation, and these are the two identifiers x and y. And you can see uh, this, um, this attribute src, that is a reference to the actual position in the source code where this, uh, this piece of the AST came from. And that is very important for, for the debugger because uh, at any point in the code it can show you, so uh, um, if you debug a transaction then you can at any point inside the execution of the transaction you know where uh, that was, where you currently are in the source code. And uh, you can also do more analysis on the AST and perhaps so uh, perhaps uh, analyze the AST for insecure stuff and uh, notify the user and point to an exact location in the source where uh, this problem is. Okay. Um, yeah, concerning safety, uh, we already had several talks about formal verification, so I won't say anything about that. Um, with the 040 release of Solidity, we added some uh, changes that intentionally broke backwards compatibility in order to add some safety features. And uh, some of them were that we uh, created exceptions uh, for in more situations than before. And the effect of an exception is that uh, a transaction is rolled back, or at least a call inside the transaction. So uh, whenever you encounter a uh, yeah, troublesome situation or some situation where it's not really clear what to do, how to deal with it, uh, at least not for the compiler, then uh, this, this basically undoes the effect of the transaction. This, is, this can be dangerous in some situations, uh, es so especially when you for example, uh, have a loop and one of the uh, iterations inside the loop always triggers an exception, then it's impossible for the loop to go through. So this is something to, to be aware of. But we chose to rather uh, revert the transaction than, so yeah, we chose to, reverting a transaction is uh, um, less of a problem than getting stuck. And so, yeah. Failed creations uh, now throw an exception. Division by zero throws an exception. And uh, yeah, function calls to a non-contract. This function calls to a non-contract is uh, especially important because if, if you call a non-contract, uh, it will basically, uh, if you send other together with it, it will just accept it and it might be forever stuck there. And then we, we have the, the payable modifier, so you now have to explicitly specify for every function whether it is allowed to receive other, and the default is to reject other. So uh, it's harder to accidentally send, uh, uh, send funds somewhere. And um, to make the, the version transition safer, we also added the version pragma. Um, which means you can now specify the compiler version your source code is designed to work with. And if we, if we change the compiler, if we change the language in the future, then this version pragma will uh, tell the developer, yeah, there might be some changes, uh, so you probably have to take a look at the source code and uh, modify it accordingly. And then some, we also fixed a problem with the modifiers. Um, so modifiers are kind of properties you can attach to functions which insert a prefix and a suffix into the function. And this underscore part there is where the actual function is inserted. And previously, if you had an, uh, previously it was more syntax-based, which means 
if the function had a return, it actually returned and in the sense that it also skipped the trailing part here. So this locked equals false would have been skipped before with a return, but it would not have been skipped if you just uh, completed the function. And this now hopefully makes it possible to uh, create uh, mutexes, uh, which allow a function to be active only once, in that there is a uh, variable in storage called locked in this example, and if the function is active, it's set to true, and it's automatically set to false again if the function exits. And if, if the function is locked, then you cannot call it. So this, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, how does the future look? Uh, <laughs> again, formal verification. Um, then one important and large feature we will add is uh, something I call authenticated sources and binaries. This means that we, the, the compiler will automatically insert a hash of the metadata into the bytecode. Um, and using this hash, you can retrieve the metadata from Swarm. Um, that means that, so the metadata will contain a lot of information about the contract. Um, this includes the ABI interface, and the effect of that is if you load up a smart contract inside MIST and want to interact with it, you do not have to copy and paste the ABI anymore. It will automatically retrieve it from Swarm. And it's also authenticated in the way that uh, that is the ABI the programmer intended the, pr the, the smart contract to have, so you can't make any uh, copy-paste errors. And it will also have a link to the source code and link in the sense of link to Swarm, of course, which means that it's, it's, uh, the source code is hash authenticated and this hash is part of the bytecode. So it's the exact source code of the, the programmer used when compiling the smart contract. And it will also have the, the compiler version, which means MIST can automatically retrieve both the ABI interface and the source code and the compiler with the correct version, compile the source code and verify that this is actually the source code, and then show the source code documentation to the user. Um, yeah, and uh, since the, the formal verification conditions are part of the source code, it can even automatically do uh, just-in-time formal verification of the smart contract. Okay, then uh, templates is something we would like to add. So, uh, this is sometimes called generic data structures or generics, and I hope that it will also increase flexibility because you can implement one tree, one routine, one algorithm once, and then reuse it for multiple data types. Uh, we will also add functions as first-class citizens. This means you can have things like uh, anonymous functions, lambda functions, and use them as, for example, as callbacks in Oracle queries. So Currently, uh, Oracleis uses some kind of, yeah, uh, manual solution to that problem because uh, if you if you make a request to Oracleis, then the Oracleis smart contract uh, invokes the Oracleis system and retrieves the data, and then calls calls back the original contract in a later transaction. And currently, this callback goes to a fixed function with a fixed name. But in the future, it will be possible to just supply a callback function as is usual in asynchronous programming. And yeah, speaking of asynchronous programming, um, not sure if you've seen this uh, proof of concept hack uh, two weeks ago about the, uh, about the await uh, way to program. So, um, yeah, we w in the future we will explore no new notations for how to, how to do asynchronous programming because often uh, smart contracts are a sequence, uh, consist of a sequence of things to be done in exactly this sequence and it kind of doesn't really make sense to put these uh, different steps in different functions and it's much easier to actually program that sequentially. Yeah, it's probably hard to explain without example. But that's okay, <laughs> you will see. So what else do we have? Yeah, so um, 
we plan to add algebraic data types and, as I said, templates, but it's probably too hard to explain the source code in this talk. Uh, and there's another slide with even more complicated future Solidity code. And I would just encourage you to uh, take a look at the slides later and read the comments. Um, yeah, and this is just a, a, a rough idea of how it could look like. So um, I hope that the URLs of the slides are published soon after the conference. And yeah, I think we we'll also have relevant Reddit posts. And yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Christian.